Kristen Smedley, who is our guest of honor today to present all this <laughs> awesome information. So thank you, Kristen. Welcome. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Thanks everybody for, for joining us here on, on um, a yet another Zoom meeting, huh? I'm so excited that you're able to tune in because I know that everybody is having a ton of screen time these days. So I'm going to I'm going to jump in. I'm going to give you my story and my philosophy on how um, behind me there is the cover of my book, Thriving Blind, how I went from crying on my couch to guiding my sons to be thriving blind. And I'm going to, I promise, I am going to um, wrap it up um, early so that we can answer questions or have conversation or how we can go. I actually am going to share some slides. I will describe the slides and I'm going to try to bounce between the slides and um, me on the screen so you're not overly um, dealing with slides. But I also, I found it, <laughs> I found it fun that as I was going through all these slides, not one of them has a picture of a person with a mask on. <laughs> these were all taken and put together um, way before all the fun of the past year and masks and the no mask, mask argument, whatever. So you are gonna see lots of pictures of faces with no masks, but please understand that they were all taken before COVID and I am loving going through them and revisiting not just some milestones in my family's life, but just being outside near people again. So at any rate, I am Kristen Smedley and this presentation is called Thriving Blind because that is my life um, that I never ever planned on nor did I dream I'd be where I am right now being able to share this with you. And I will say to all of those parents that in the poll, it was great to see that bar so far over to the right with so many parents on. Um, you guys are my number one. You're my number one uh, audience, outreach, everything for this year. Um, and and TVIs and all of you that were that are the most in the audience tonight, you guys are my heroes and sheroes that are guiding our kids to your greatness, to their greatness. Um, all of you, I'm so happy that you're here. But parents especially, I want you to hear my message tonight and I want you to reach out to me and I have some programs and things that we can get together on that I'll talk about later. Um, but I want everybody to understand and for all of you that work with um, either up and coming TVIs or work with families, um, I, I want you all to understand and really hear me tonight that I smile all the time now but I did not start there. And when you hear my story, that's a little extraordinary. I'm a little bit of an overachiever and so are my kids. I want you to know that if I can do this and show you my journey and where I am now with this smile on my face, living literally brilliantly resilient, if I can do this, anybody can. It just takes a little bit of grit and grace in the beginning and all of the effort, especially for all of you all of you families that are in the early stages, like you just heard that your child is blind um, or visually impaired and you weren't prepared, trust me when I tell you, I know the sucker punch to your heart. I know it, I've been there uh, more than once. And if I can do this now, you can too. And I am happy to hold your hand um, while, while the rest of the folks in here that are TVIs and, and at university and all the different roles you have to push us parents along, I'm here to hold your hand, maybe drag you along a little bit, just a little bit um, to get to where I am. So let's dive in. So this picture is um, a baseball championship team where they're all holding up their trophies. And you can see in the background that the score says nine to three. And the title of my slide is Thriving Blind. What do baseball and thriving blind have to do with each other? Well, usually nothing, but I promise you that I will tell you about, you're going to see this slide, this picture again later in this presentation, but I want you to hold on to this thought and those smiles that we can see because all right, I'm going to belabor the point. There's no masks. I won't talk about it anymore. I'm over it. I'll stop talking about my frustration with the world. At any rate, so these, oh boy, can I advance? Here we go. I can work technology, right? These are my kids uh, a couple of years ago. That's Mitch is on the far left with the, um, the pinkish. He says it's salmon. Real men wear salmon. 
uh, shirt on and my Carissa and my Michael is standing right next to me. And then there's me in the picture and you can see on everybody's shirt, if you can see the slide that we're wearing Martha's Vineyard shirts where we took a vacation to Martha's Vineyard just a couple of summers ago. It was one of those, you know, by happen circumstance, a friend happened to have a house there that had a few days open. We had a few days open and we were just coming off of one of life's biggest sucker punches and we needed to just have some time together. And we got five days. Um, up there and I encourage you to go I'll tell you my website later I have a blog about the sunsets if you've been to Martha's Vineyard and know about the sunsets oh my goodness I have an awesome blog that I did about one of the beaches and something that my Mitchell said to me about sunset so um, I'll share that with you later but these are my kiddos and my daughter hates this picture because <laughs> she's the shortest in the picture and now she's the youngest but she is the tallest but I do have one of her later so I just want to point out that we are a typical family very much like all of your families probably. Um, this is when we learned how to do stand-up paddle boarding on vacation. I was supposed to be doing stand-up paddle boarding. My kids got a hold of those things and then didn't give me any turns. We had such a good time with it. Um, this is skiing. We love doing uh, vacations, traveling, trying all kinds. We're sports. We are a sports foursome. We love doing all kinds of things. This was Mitch surfing. Um, Mitch is flying a kite. My family, my entire extended family, all four brothers, parents, all the kids and everyone go to a beach vacation every summer where my dad has this thing about flying kites. And that, if you can see in the picture it is a kite with Elsa from Frozen. And Mitchell was very proud to fly that Elsa kite. It was hilarious. Carissa at a soccer tournament, Michael uh, doing a back dive. He was on the dive and swim team for years. Mitch horseback riding. And then this, my daughter's going to be so proud that I added this today, but this is us last summer where you can see that she is the tallest. And I was joking on Facebook today when I added this slide that we are absolutely a typical family in so many ways, because right before and right after this picture where we all look like we are so in love and enjoying each other, there was about 57 arguments. And I'm sure a slapping or slugging match happened around the time of this photo. So yes, we are incredibly typical, um, like most families. However, we have some things about us, like a lot of you that are watching, that are what I call extraordinary. And a lot of times I put the this presentation together and call it set extraordinary expectations. And you'll see why in a few minutes. But I want, in, I want the word extraordinary to land on all of you for a minute, because I'm not talking about my family being extraordinary and how much I want you, all of you that are either raising or working with blind and visually impaired children to realize that they're extraordinary. I'm not saying that in an overachieving um, kind of way or, you know, the dreaded super blind. If you're on social media, there's a lot of uh, some shaming about being super blind. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about extraordinary, like this part of the definition beyond what is usual, ordinary, regular, the regular kinds of things, the ordinary things you think about. This is beyond that. It's outside of what's ordinary. And I want you to think about the word that's highlighted there, remarkable and remarkable in a very good way. You know, I say that I showed you all those pictures that we are quite the typical family, but what we have that is extraordinary is that if I could work this, it would be so cool. Here we go. What we have that's extraordinary is two of my three children were born blind. Um, with that's, that's Mitch in the middle with his cane. Uh, Michael is on the right of the slide with his cane and Carissa um, is, is fully sighted. Although Michael used to, when people would ask him all the time, oh, is your sister blind too? He would say, this is when she was like 12 and a tween. And he would say, well, um, her eyes are fine. It's her attitude that's a problem. <laughs> She's grown up a lot since he has said that. So anyway, so today I wanted to lay out my, how, how I went from not so thriving, not anywhere near thriving to literally thriving. And like I mentioned earlier, resilient and brilliantly resilient. Um, I want you to think about this, this wheel, if you will, I got to work with a graphics designer to, to portray this a little better, but what but my, my philosophy here is, and my process is that our perceptions, which is down the bottom of the, of the screen, are driving our expectations, which are absolutely determining our outcomes. So let's unpack that for a few minutes. As I said, my boys 
we're born with. It's actually a very rare blindness. I don't know if we have any LCA folks in the room tonight, but my boys are um, LCA, the CRB1 gene, um, that, and both of them are affected by this. CRB1, LCA, um, they are, you know, half the patients are, are, half of CRB1 is LCA, and the other half are RP. What is the difference? Well, I am no scientist. I work with scientists, but I am certainly no scientist. My little third grade version of that is the LCA kids, you know, in the first year of life that something is not going right with their eyes. The RP kids, at least in CRB1, they start realizing around maybe 9, 10, 11, and this is just in the um, few hundred of patients that we have analyzing that data, around, around 9, 10, 11, all of a sudden there's some problems with seeing the board, navigating at night, a few things that don't seem quite right. Regardless in CRB1, everybody, whether you're LCA or RP, by your 20s, 30s, maybe 40s, we're still doing a natural history study to get really good data on this. But for the most part, everybody somewhere in that 20 to 30s loses most of, of their vision. So it definitely, and it does affect the rods and the cones for any of you medical folks out there. So I always say it's a, it's a one-two punch to the retina. It does take out the rods and the cones. Now, you know, as you can imagine, if you're anything like me, um, I was not prepared for a diagnosis like this. I, um, I actually had, had planned my entire life from like the time I was five years old. I'm one of those, I don't know what it is about me if it, because I went to Catholic school, because I'm a Virgo. I don't know what it is about me that I make all of my plans and I need them to come to fruition. I need to check the box. Like I love all the lists. I love polls like we just did. I love all those kinds of things. And I love hitting the finish line over and over and over again with all of my goals. And uh, if I can for a minute, talk to the, the parents out there that um, experience a diagnosis as well, you can probably absolutely relate to the fact that as you're carrying that baby, for nine months, you know, as, as my belly was growing, my hopes and dreams for my Michael, my first child were like going off the charts. And, you know, maybe you're like me where like you get the, what to expect to when you're expecting book, right. And memorize it. And, and I was like looking weeks ahead and months ahead and checking off that we were ahead of schedule on a lot of things. But as I'm reading that, I start off with, Oh, I just want a healthy baby. <laughs> and the time month eight, comes around, I'm like, he's going to be the starting pitcher, you know, and it, if it's a girl, she's going to do this. If it's a boy, he's going to do this. And I know we're going to have an athlete and oh my God, what sport are they going to play? And, and valedictorian wedding, like all of those hopes and dreams are in your head. Right. And then you hear the words, your child is blind. And for me, that's a planner. No, I hadn't even met a blind person when I heard that 21 years ago. Um, in a little exam room when Michael was four and a half months old. I had never known a blind person ever in my life. So I had absolutely no point of reference. And I don't know about you all that have heard those words or work with families that have heard those words, but, and I don't know what the next sentence was that you were able to receive from a specialist, but the next sentence I got was good luck. There was no, now, okay, give this person some grace, right? This is 21 years ago. There was no Facebook and Instagram and all these ways to share information. Um, so, and my first question was, will he play baseball? And the doctor said, no. And I said, is he even going to be able to go to school? And he said, probably not. You're going to have to find a special school. I was a teacher. So that was just like, it was every single thing that I had ever known felt like it had been torn away from me. And I had absolutely no resources, no point of reference, not one role model, not one to go to, to say, how am I supposed to do this? So I wanna be able to get to how we moved into thriving. So I'm gonna let, I'm gonna leave that there and I'm gonna ask you to go look at my, uh, my TEDx talk. And I think you're gonna get links to that tonight um, to go and, and hear that whole story. I certainly don't wanna glaze over it here. Um, for all of you, if, you're, if you have been there, if you are still stuck there, please watch my TED talk and then reach out to me. I just wanna um, continue uh, 
down the path to, to thriving here. But I, I, I wanted to set it up so that you know that I sat there um, for too long, actually, trying to get my head around what raising a blind child was going to be. I am not proud at all, but I share this story almost every single day that I sat on my couch crying for three years, three years. Now, during the day I would do, you know, I would do the fake smile. I would do the, I'm going to find a silver lining. You know, I would try and try and try. And every, every single night in tears, I would pray blindness away. Every single morning I would walk into Michael's bedroom and see him in that crib and see him not see me. And I'd be right back to angry every single day for three years. Now, again, I'm not proud of that, but I, I think it's important so that you understand that when I said, if I can do this, anybody can do this. If you know LCA, then you may know that the LCA, Leber's congenital amaurosis, you may know that there's a 25% chance with every pregnancy of having an affected child. So having a second child was not anywhere in the plan with their dad and I um, until about two and a half years, I started thinking, I come from a very big family and I wanted a big family and I couldn't fathom having an only child. And then if I could be completely honest with all of you, um, I also started to think that if I had another child, regardless if that child was blind or not, Michael would have a built-in friend because at that point I didn't understand how, I mean, I was very social growing up. I had a huge community and I was on, I can't even tell you how many teams and shows at school and all these activities. And I couldn't fathom how Michael was gonna navigate a community. Like where was the community gonna find a place for him and how was he gonna have friends? Again, it is not something that I'm proud of but to be perfectly transparent and real, that's what was on my mind. So I started talking to people about, you know, how people that were only children that were adults, what was their life like? Because I guess I'm like a research nerd. I got to ask a million questions before I make a decision. I talked to a lot of um, psychologists, child psychologists about, you know, and people in the, in the um, blind and visually impaired field, whether you should have siblings, not have siblings. I mean, I like I have in one of my books that's coming that's coming out this year. I say that if there's a Super Bowl for overthinkers, I'm the MVP. I mean, I can overthink something to death. And I was just trying to get my head around all of this different stuff. So lo and behold, I decided that it would be harder for me to see my son be an only child and not have a family, you know, siblings around him or at least one sibling than it would be to deal with a double diagnosis. And I should also mention that if there is a memoir written about my life right now, it would probably be titled The Delirious Optimist, because I'm thinking to myself, there is no way that this could happen to me twice. Like, what are the chances? So I kept saying 25% chance is very small compared to 75% chance of unaffected. Like, let's go for it. And Delirious Optimist Kristen was at the wheel for about seven and a half months. And Michael was about three and a half at this point, three and a half years old. And I'm now pregnant, seven and a half months pregnant with a sibling. And, and one morning, delirious optimist, Kristen didn't get out of bed that morning. It was the math major in college. Kristen showed up and hit the panic button. Like you can't even imagine. Cause all of a sudden I started to think, oh my God, 25% chance is a really big deal. Like this, what if this happens again? And the realist really started sitting there trying to unpack how was I going to have two blind kids? And I was at my lowest low and I've had some serious sucker punches to my life in the past 21 years. But that morning I was at the lowest low because I felt like as a mom, I had dreamt my whole life to be a mom. I had big hopes and dreams three years prior, and now I had nothing. I had nothing. I had no idea how to do this. Now I was potentially going to have to do it twice. No tools, no resources, no friends in the game, nothing. I had nothing. And I don't like to start from nothing. It's not, it's not in my wheelhouse to have nothing. So I was an absolute manic mess 
that morning. And I talk about it in my TED talk of the prayer that I said that morning, which was a tantrum of all tantrums, screaming that I could not do this twice. And then this little face came into my room and he said, what is now the most famous line? I just saw it on a t-shirt the other day. I guess it's getting around. He said, mommy, isn't this the best day ever? And I thought, are you kidding me? This is the best day ever. Like you have no idea what you're missing out on. But the thing is, and you'll see it in my TED talk, the whole thing that happened, but Michael always had this smiling face with his little wire rim glasses. And he was happy all the flipping time, like all the time, all the time. Even if like somebody took a toy from him and hurt his feelings, he'd smile through tears coming down his face, trying to understand how, what just happened. Like he was always happy. And in that moment, it dawned on me that again, the lowest day of my life, Michael had figured everything out for three and a half years, he had figured everything out that he wanted to do. Blindness was not getting in his way. His mom was the only thing standing in his way of doing everything he wanted to do. I was afraid to let him run around the park. I was afraid to send him to the neighbor's house to play. I was afraid of what his life was gonna be. And I was so mad that it wasn't gonna turn out the way I wanted to. And I can tell you all this, from 21 years of having that little face on this planet with me that I've had a front row seat to his life. The best thing that ever happened to me is that my hopes and dreams for him were squashed because I learned with Michael and with Mitchell and with my daughter, Carissa, that their life is not about my hopes and dreams for them. And I know that's hard for moms to hear and teachers to hear and all of us that do their education plans and set the goals and want them to achieve, go to college and all that stuff. It's not about us. It's about what is their purpose? What is their life? What was Michael on this planet to do? What did he wanna do and how was he gonna do it? So I made a commitment at that moment that it was not about me I would get out of his way. And all I, all I prayed for that day was send me all of the tools and the resources and the people that Michael needed. And I would, I would be the conduit to his hopes and dreams and to his life having full purpose. I would be that person that got him what he needed and then follow his lead. And that was all I could do in that moment. Did it make my life easy and I stopped crying? Nope because I'm still a mom, right? I still was like doubting and, and all of that and trying to connect to the right people. And again, we didn't have social media and a really big internet back then, but I will say that I made that decision. I changed how I looked at things and it made all the difference. And then not that long after that moment, Mitch came into the world. And this is a picture of Michael at three and a half with Mitch, a newborn. Um, and I've done that ever since I, I took them by the hands literally became their sighted guide in life. I've gotten them what they've needed and, and I have followed their lead to some incredible places. So let's unpack this for a little bit. So as I said, your perceptions are driving your expectations, which are creating your outcomes. And if you all are like me, um, this is a picture that I call diagnosis day. And I mentioned it a little bit about what happened on our diagnosis day. If you can't see this, it is, well, and it's an interesting interpretation. I've done this in, one time I was in a ballroom with like 2,000 people and I was taking a poll of what they considered this. And I did it on social media the week leading up to that speech. And people have said this is, it was like 98.7% of people said this is a peaceful photo. A little family looks like maybe in a canoe or a kayak out on very calm water. The sun is either rising or setting. Beautiful orange, super calm, nobody else around, nice little family photo. And so many people ask me if this is from a vacation of mine. No, and I say, this was my worst nightmare where most people see this as a peaceful vacation. This was my worst nightmare. And maybe a lot of you started this way also with that doctor saying, basically, go blind, go home. Good luck. I have nothing to tell you. And I felt like this picture represents him sending me and my little family out on the water. The sun was going down, darkness was coming. We had absolutely no resources to turn to, nowhere to go. Um, absolutely 100%
fear, sadness, scared, all the things, right? Is it any wonder that we start this journey? And this is why I work so hard now to have you all and everyone else not starting the journey in fear, but more so in at least armed with a, a resource or two to get started on this journey. So knowing that this is how all of you know my journey and probably a lot of you start. And when you poll the, the world, you know, blindness is something like this most second feared thing to happen to a person. Other, I think it's only second to death. Um, is it any wonder then, because our perceptions of blindness are fearful and, and horrible, that 21 million Americans are considered blind or visually impaired and 70% of them are unemployed. Like these are the statistics because of our perceptions. But I am gonna, I am gonna show you how, how we all can be a part of changing that that no one's been able to change in what, like 50 years. I was on a committee the other day and they said it's been 50 years and the needle has not moved. It's still 70% unemployment rate. I promise this gets more uplifting. I promise, just, just hang in there with me. All right, so we got a 70% unemployment rate, right? Here's the statistics that were like, it was like uppercut, uppercut, knockout punch to, to my heart, my mind, and my gut that 30% of blind Americans are living below the poverty line. Only 31.5% are getting a high school diploma or GED, and only 14.4% of blind and visually impaired American youth are getting their bachelor's degree or higher. I didn't even know these horrible statistics until Michael was in middle school. But that is when the perception of blindness is sadness, fear, upsetment, um, no achievement, no expectation. Of course, there's no expectation. And of course, we're going to have outcomes like this. And it's actually not that hard to turn this around. It's, it's a lot of effort, but I have a little process here that we can turn it around. So some of you, or maybe most of you, because you're on this webinar, that tells me you're more of the thinking camp like I am, that you've, that you've got an intention like I do. And I, I say in the setting extraordinary expectations um, process of how I went from crying on my couch to thriving, there were four key areas that I'm gonna dive through here to change my perception, keep it in check, set the extraordinary expectations and drive the outcomes that I wanted which my kids would probably quote me on that and say, see, you are a bit of a control freak. Well, so be it, right? But I was going to take control of this situation. And the first thing, the first thing that you have to do, at least for me, what worked for me was to set the intention. To set the intention that, like I said that day, I, I didn't know how to get my boys into thriving instead of just living and surviving. But I was darn sure going to do everything I could to find out. So I had to set the intention. I have on here, if you're a fan of Simon Sinek, he says, know your why. And those of you, you know, with businesses and stuff, you may have heard this in a different context, but I say in terms of going from surviving to thriving, a thing like a blindness diagnosis, diagnosis you have got to set your intention that that child is going to live their full purpose and you're going to get them all the tools that they need um, and know your why. And this is my little why, why Michael, um, and if you're wondering if, if I, if I had a little breakdown after Mitchell's diagnosis, when he was diagnosed at four and a half months old, um, I did for a couple of days, but I had the number one tool that I did not have with Michael that a lot of people don't have. And I worked so hard to bring it to them is a role model. When Mitch was born and diagnosed, Michael was my built-in role model. He was now nearing four years old and he was still happy and achieving everything he wanted. He just had to get creative. So this was Michael on... The first day of kindergarten and you'll see some pictures come through here and just a little sidebar for those of you with more than one child you might be like me i have a picture of everything michael ever did i for probably 10 years i had a picture of every every hour of his life and this is our mailbox you know the first day of kindergarten with this little bus tag right second one you know i had some good stuff early on by the third one i have like a file of post-it notes i tell chris all the time go on facebook if you need a picture of something in your life but anyway that's a fun little sidebar. But Michael, here's, here's the other thing with, with perceptions. You know, knowing that people are, are considering blindness to be um, so scary and, and people can't achieve anything if they can't see anything and they can't navigate in a sighted world and there's got, not going to be any thriving, 
the expectations are so impacted. And I know this full well, and a lot of you probably know it full well. And I love to present this information in a room where I can actually have a conversation with TVIs because we've had some very interesting conversations about this, but bear with me for a minute. The, the, the straw that broke the camel's back with Kristen Smedley going in a full press, if you're a basketball fan, I mean, I was in a full court press with the IEP team that we had to change some things because Michael sailed through preschool so much so that people were on the, on the team there were saying that he wasn't really blind, that I was crazy because he did so well in preschool. He gets to the, one of the number one schools in the country um, here in the Philadelphia area. And one of their goals was that he would find his cubby 70% of the time. And I said to them, why is it 70% and not 100% of the time? Because I've been watching him for five years and he can find his cubby every day. And they said, if he found his cubby 70% of the time, 70 was like over 100% because he's blind, Kristen. That's what they said to me. That was the, that was the mindset of the IEP team. I am proud to say that after a lot of work, a lot of the mindsets change, but I'm sure that a lot of you can think of at least one or two people on your teams that maybe they just never do change their perception. You got to work around them. We could talk about that another time. But the perception was that Michael was at best going to achieve 70%. And that was, that, that was the that was the IEP team at a top school in Pennsylvania and in the country. And it went right through to the school board and everybody, all the administration. So it was an uphill battle changing perceptions and then getting him what he needed. But they absolutely, because their perceptions were off. I didn't realize this till about first, second grade. It was their perceptions that needed to change before I could get anything in terms of raising expectations. Otherwise, I was just an annoying mom coming in there yelling, right? So I had to do some work to change their perceptions. And I'll tell you how I did that in a little bit. But remember, I had to then change how I was communicating about, I couldn't say you're going to change your expectation because I told you so. I had to make sure that they understood that we were going to do stuff outside of what they typically thought. And I will say they did. I asked them to trust me and, and go my way for one year, you know, kindergarten into first grade to start thinking outside of what everybody else was doing with blind children because it wasn't working for my son. He was going backwards as opposed to accelerating. And I knew he was gifted. I knew that he was um, on a track to do so much better. So I had to ask them to, to go outside of what was usual, ordinary, regular, like the dictionary slide again that I have here, to be extraordinary. Here's the second piece though, that is so crucial. And I saw it firsthand or I never would have put the pieces of this together. The second piece in this process of extraordinary expectations and achievement is Ignition, and if you saw my, if you read my book, Thriving Blind, you know that I, I quote Ralph Waldo Emerson in there with this quote here, our chief want is someone who will inspire us to be what we know we could be. Think about that for a second. And also in my book, I talk about um, the talent code and, and I know a lot of teachers have read that book. And if you haven't read it, I, I encourage you over the summer to go read that. And in the talent code, um, he talks about uh, Daniel, I'll think of his name and last name in a minute. Um, he talks about how when you see somebody doing something you want to do and you see them having success with it, or you see somebody like you having success doing something you want to do, it ignites something in you. It's, it's, a, it's an anomaly with this whole role model concept that it ignites something actually in your brain that says, if she can do it, I can do it. If he can do it, I can do it. Which is why, why my journey and this whole thriving blind that I'll tell you where we started and, and where we are now, it is all this whole thing of ignition. And I realized that that must be something in my core that has always been important to me because it lights me up to see people ignite me, but also for me to ignite other people. How do you do that? What, is that, what does that look like for a blind child? You know, how is my son gonna gonna you know see people doing what they what uh, he wants to do, and people are just like him? Like, here's a picture of my daughter when she was obsessed with soccer. I am a lifelong soccer player. She was obsessed with soccer for quite some time, and then switched to field hockey. I swear it was just to give me a heart attack. But anyway, this was Chris and meeting Carly Lloyd. 
one of the top soccer players in the world, Carissa got to meet her. She also got to sit with her soccer team and see Carly Lloyd and Abby Wambach and Alex Morgan and that team playing on the TV all the time. I didn't have that when I was a kid, so I didn't know there was a future in soccer for women, right? But my daughter has grown up with those role models igniting, fueling her mind to say, they can be a professional athlete. I could surely be a professional athlete, you know, if I did all the work and all of that. So, you know, and think of if you have a, um, you know, Carissa also will watch, we're watching March Madness. Now we're obsessed with it, with basketball. She's a basketball player. She gets to watch people just like her on TV, doing what she wants to do and then eventually do it. Mitch is obsessed with, with <laughs> some of the news people that I, I won't mention because it's going to cause a whole firestorm of people on the news this past year. He wants to go into broadcasting. He watches people that are in broadcasting wants to do it. So my point is that they have these role models. Well, gosh, all those years ago, when, when I heard about all this, I'm thinking, you know, what role models do my boys have? They don't have anybody on TV. They can just turn it on every day or, you know, Netflix or, you know, all the stuff. Now it, it's a little more accessible, but back then it certainly wasn't. And then along comes a guy named Eric Ryan there. Someone had sent me Eric's book, that first one, Touch the Top of the World, when I was just beginning this journey. And it blew my mind, literally, that this man, for the first half of the book, struggles with the blindness diagnosis, hated it as much as I did, fought it as much as I did, was as angry as I was. And then the second half of the book, he becomes a mountain climber and climbs Everest completely blind and his life completely turns around. For me, he was the first ignition that, oh my God, I can get my son to the top of his own mountain, my sons to the top of their own mountains and get the right tools. But the best part was when Michael was six years old, Eric happened to be here in Philly giving a speech and I found out about it because me and his dad are friends now. We joke all the time that he's always like, you have a little bit of, you have a little bit of stalker in you, don't you, Kristen? I'm like, yes, I do. When I need a resource for my kids, I will stalk you. And I found out they were coming to Philly, ended up meeting them. Michael met Eric. So imagine this. And Michael's very short for, he was very short for his age, with his little glasses. He's six years old and meets a man that is just like him that just came off Everest something that no sighted person to this day that he has ever met has been able to say they did that. Of course, you know, Eric went on to climb all seven summits, but at that moment, Michael's having a conversation with a guy that also was a wrestler and Michael just started wrestling, also was blind, also talked about Braille, also had a white cane and did this huge thing of climbing ever. So Michael's little mind, I watched his wheels that day that he had this light of like, no one was ever going to tell him that something was impossible. It was always going to be possible because this guy just summited Everest and did something sighted people don't do. And from that moment on, I spent every year, luckily here in Philly, there was a big award ceremony where um, they honored people. That's why Eric was here for, he was the man of the year for being a role model for the blind community. And I am proud to say that my boys won that award a few years later but we have met in, in this picture that Michael's with Tom Lukowski in the middle. And Tom Lukowski is a um, vice president at Comcast. He's totally blind. Um, Kathy Nimmer was a teacher of the year, like national teacher of the year finalist. Um, she's blind also. And uh, Chris Downey, there's a great TED talk to watch. Chris Downey's TED talk. He's an architect. He was an architect, goes blind due to a surgery that saved his life and um, wakes up totally blind uh, he was a sighted architect, I should say, goes blind in a surgery, wakes up completely blind and goes back to work as an architect a month later because he was a role model for his son. He wanted his son to understand that you got to get back out there after setbacks. And now he's busy and more successful than he was as a sighted architect. These are the kinds of people that I surrounded my boys with to make sure that they had a perspective that was in check. Oh, I should also mention that when Eric was in Philly, um, we got a new principal when Michael was in first grade at the elementary school who came from a special ed background and he sent himself and the entire IEP team. Now, I understand this is an experience that not many people have. The entire IEP team went to hear Eric speak. So as much as Michael was ignited that day, here's his whole team that was going to take him to sixth grade, all the way through to sixth grade, whose perceptions were completely shifted 
and made that, that whole switch over to extraordinary that day. It was absolutely unbelievable. Okay, here's the next part. So ignition is huge with role models, as is your intention that this child is going to thrive, right? Here's the next one. And this is the one that we just got to get, this is where the grit comes in. Like you just got to identify the obstacles. You got to figure out what the pieces are. That's why I love, I actually do love the IEP itself and the whole um, concept of it, that we sit there and break it down. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? Um, you know, what can we do to support this learner? Um, so you have to identify the obstacles. And I love this quote, if you know, Michael Phelps, one of the greatest swimmers on the planet. I'm a little bit into sports. I tend to reference that all the time. He says, there will be obstacles, but with hard work, belief, and confidence, there are no limits. And I want those words, hard work, belief, and confidence to land because those are the three things that have been the biggest in my family that have propelled my guys to live their dreams and not mine, to, to really have a limitless um, outlook on things. Does everything work out for them? Nope. Does everything work out for anybody? Nope. But they certainly, it isn't about blindness 99.99% of the time. It's, it's um, if it doesn't work out, it's just something that either wasn't meant to be or it's just not the right time. So you have to identify the obstacles. I don't know about you all, but when I, when the boys were first diagnosed and in those first several years, the word braille made my stomach flip in not good ways. Um, and the white cane was very hard for me and seeing the reaction to the white cane. And I can remember several times being in Disney World that my heart would sink every time because it was so many people all at once with kids, my kids' ages, walking around. And the look of sadness and pity was almost overwhelming to me. But I learned to use that to fuel um, my work, um, to change those perceptions, because there's, there's a lot of people out there when you have that perception, like I said, the expectations are low. Um, and that's what's causing so many issues with employers not wanting to employ our blind workers and a few other things. So I knew I had a lot of work to do. I am proud to say now that we, my daughter even notices, she'll say to the boys, we'll be in a, you know, when we were able to travel in a hotel or something and she'll go, oh boys, here we go. We got some newbies, they've never seen canes. And the boys get all dramatic, like, you know, using their cane real dramatic, it's whatever. They're a little crazy, but um, it was very hard for me to, to accept Braille and the white cane early on. And I did, I will be honest, I started Michael too late and he didn't start until preschool, late preschool, probably pre-K with Braille and then serious Braille in kindergarten and first grade. Uh, Mitch was like born and into Braille. Um, and Mitch has outachieved Michael, but don't tell Michael that. But at any rate, um, they were very hard things for me, but I knew that in my value system and in our family's value system, education, confidence, and independence were huge. That's what I wanted to achieve for my boys, a solid education, give them the confidence to take on the world and the independence to not live with me for the rest of their lives. <laughs> oh, I laugh about that now, but sometimes, oh my goodness. And I, and you know, years ago, I thought they are gonna live with me for the rest of their lives. They're not gonna have jobs, you know, they're blind, they're not gonna be able to do anything. And then when I started meeting all those role models, I'm like, they can go do anything. And for the love of Pete, my kids can drive you crazy, right? We don't want them in our houses for the rest of our lives. So I knew that those were the things they needed. So I had to get my head and heart around these tools and thank God I did. And one more thing that they needed to, um, we were very lucky out here that we had camp abilities, um, which is a sports camp for the blind. I know there's several around the country and I can get you information on them or you can Google camp abilities. Um, they train blind athletes. It, it, it just so happens the one here in Pennsylvania, they train for a triathlon. Um, and I'm going to talk about this element in my next piece of this four piece thing. But they met other kids like themselves. My boys did. They met other kids that are blind and insanely into athletics the way they were. And they didn't have to worry about things being adapted and talking about adapting because it was already done for them. Programs like that are huge still in my kids' lives um, because it's they develop not just the skills of blindness and the confidence and the independence, they create a tribe of people that are like them. And I will tell you this story real quick. 
and I will be cognizant of the time so that I can keep some time for questions. Um, I didn't realize the power of my sons knowing other blind children until one day when I saw my son, Michael, he was about seven in a blind sports program in, in Philly, having a conversation with a kid that was, he almost had the same exact vision impairment. He had the same obsession. I think it was over the Phillies at the time. He had so many things like him, but when the, when the blindness thing wasn't an issue or they were like laughing about what sighted people do and all of that, I saw Michael's shoulders relax and he had this joy about him that I hadn't seen. And he was the happiest kid I had ever seen. And I asked him about it one time when he was older and he said, mom, it's just about when you get to talk with another person that is on the same kind of journey as you, you don't have to worry about making that person feel comfortable or make them understand at all what you're going through. They get it. So that's off the table and you can just chill. So I thought that was pretty cool, but it's so important. It was very important for my boys to have their own tribe as it was for me and for you parents out there. That's what I'm creating now is that you have a tribe to come to, to, to complain to, complain with, um, to get um, advice from, to get encouragement, all those kinds of things. You have to have your own tribe. But these are just some pictures, Michael at Camp Abilities with um, fellow athletes. The one on the, on the right side of him, I went to high school with her mom. And the one on the left side of him, I went to college with her aunt. Insane. It's insane how sometimes it's a very small world. And Mitch is, always wants this picture in there. He was out at the Braille Challenge. He was invited to the Braille Challenge finals more times than Michael. It's not something we talk about in this house because it's a point of contention among the brothers that are always in competition. So like I said, perceptions are driving your expectations and they're creating your outcomes. And if you want some, I'm gonna give you some proof here that what I say actually has merit because that day that I changed my perception of blindness that it was not gonna be a barrier, um, it was gonna be the fuel to go get my sons the tools they needed was the day I started having extraordinary expectations outside of what the whole rest of the world was telling me they could or couldn't do. And the outcomes, I'm just gonna give you a few highlights. Michael was in every honor society in every subject he was in in high school. This one happens to be the National Honor Society. Um, you know, one of the things I thought was not gonna be an option was prom, because remember I had that issue that I thought he wasn't gonna have any friends. Michael has so many stinking friends that I'm trying to move because he's in college now and they're all headed to college. I'm trying to downsize. <laughs> And he wants room for when they all come back because he brings them all back from college for breaks. But we have had no problems with having friends. And this, the inset of the prom picture there is, um, you know, I wanted blindness to be in the background of my boys' lives. And Michael, in his prom proposal, brought it front and center with Braille. I am raising very charming young men because Michael found out his date's favorite cookie and we baked them and individually wrapped them. And then he used them to make the, the Braille to spell prom. That happened to actually go viral. It was, it was crazy. Um, and then uh, Mitch was in middle school sports because being in camp abilities and blind sports programs, they learned how to play the sport with the adaptations. And then it, it took them right into the regular community sports. Uh, Mitch was also identified as a top athlete in the United States, a blind athlete. And last year we were out at, before COVID, we were out at Colorado Springs, USA headquarters, where he trained um, with lots of sports, but mostly goalball. Um, and then here's the best. This was, you know, one of the things with my boys was social, their social lives. And, and I'm not diving into that today, but social lives were a very big deal. I wanted them, like I said, to, to have friends and community and they did all the blind sports. Um, and then they just started transferring that to our regular community stuff. When Michael was nine, he didn't want to be in blind baseball anymore or beat baseball. He wanted to be on the regular local team. And then right after that, Mitchell wanted to be on the local team too. And I will say that I have a community that is a little unheard of in this country where they rallied and figured it out with my boys in a way that my boys were able to contribute as teammates, not as a token blind kid on the team. There were two small adaptations we had to do and they were, they were actually both all-stars, but here's the coolest part and that picture I had in the beginning. Both of my boys were on the orange Mets in our regular little league team three years apart, but they both won championships. And like I said, they were both voted all-stars. The social goals were very important to me. And um, we did have success with that following our little thriving process. And then here's, 
Here's one of my most favorite ones. This is Michael again at the mailbox on his first day of kindergarten. And then, like I said, firstborn, picture of everything, Michael at the same mailbox, now way taller than it on graduation day. Oh my gosh, I was so proud. You know, like I said, it was, it was a lot of work and there was a lot of tears. There was a lot of frustration, but there was a lot of success and happy on his, on his 12 year journey through our school system. And if you can see the picture, you see that there are tons of braids. It's this thing with every achievement, there's these braids that they wear or cords or something and a, um, a medal for being uh, one of the highest achieving students as well as the stole around his neck. He was an officer, voted officer, elected officer in his class all four years, um, including his senior year. Um, you know, Michael achieved way more than I could have ever thought possible. And then this one now um, on, the, on the left there is us at Penn State where Michael is a junior now. We were moving him in uh, with the dogs. We took the dogs up to surprise him. And um, on the right is Michael and Mitchell. It, the picture got a little screwed up, it, but this is um, a screenshot from a video that they did online because they're now mentors for um, other blind kids, families, and teachers. And they're doing a, a webinar here for the APH next week about the technology that they use. Um, and I'll tell you a big part of why that is in a minute, but I'm gonna wrap up here to say that when I published the book, thriving blind two years ago. It was actually one of the worst times in my life. My, my uh, husband of 19 years had walked out. Things were not good here. But I thought about um, what was my, my one thing that I could really serve the world in at the time when I um, was really um, down in the dumps. And, and it was the fact that so many people were coming to me saying, how did you do this with the boys? How did you do this? How did you do this? And I, my number one thing was role models. And I would say to everybody, you got to find blind people that are succeeding without sight that you can talk to and learn from and get mentors. And then I thought, gosh, I know several that are phenomenal of all walks of life, men and women, stay at home parents and mountain climbers from Everest. Let me put them all in a book. And Eric so graciously um, wrote the foreword for me. Um, like I said, I've had a friendship with their family, but it was important to me to share that because who, you know, who am I to know these folks and not be able to share them with everybody? Um, and that book then um, turned into a Facebook community that maybe some of you have heard about. And if not, I, I hope that you'll join it. The Thriving Blind page on Facebook is a phenomenal community um, where we give resources. I usually do... Um, Facebook interviews, because that's kind of my thing, getting me to sit and write. When I published that book, I remember I was like, oh my God, all the English teachers I've ever had are probably like needing oxygen because Kristen actually shut up and wrote something for once instead of talking her way around everything. So it became a really thriving Facebook community. Um, and now it's actually a membership program where it's, it's um, weekly uh, ways for, for people to connect and connect mentors to each other, to resources, to tools, the whole thing that I, that I've done and grown this network. Um, it's now in a membership program. And you may have heard of our succeed without sight summit that we did in November. And we're going to do again this year because we had 17 countries, over 200 people. Like I know that folks like you, um, want and need these resources and, and the world shut down with COVID, but it opened up an opportunity to virtually be able to connect, um, especially through things like this with the APH. And, and um, I'm going to be working with Family Connect here on some virtual tools also. So it really has grown um, in ways that I never could have imagined. And when I tell you that as I'm sitting in a Zoom room in November with over 200 people from 17 countries all messaging me saying it's exactly the information they needed. And I thought, I said to them all, the fact that I started crying on my couch thinking me and my boys were gonna be all alone and achieving nothing to where we are now impacting 17 plus countries. If I can do that, and if my boys can do what they've done, you can do it too. And I'm here to, to be the resource with Family Connect and others to help. So in closing, I want you to I want you to remember this picture, even though it might be hard for you if this was your diagnosis day. And I want the people that are, that are in this meeting right now that are on someone's IEP team to remember this picture. Or if you're a family member 
or um, somebody in the life of someone that heard that diagnosis and was set out on the water in this scene where things were going dark and they felt so alone and scared. I want you to remember that because that's where we start, right? With empathy, meeting each other where we're at and knowing a little bit of, of a piece of the journey makes it easier to move forward to do this. This is the dream now. This is what we're creating at APH with Family Connect a thriving blind with other resources, with the summit, this is the dream. I wanted that day to have been dropped off in a harbor where there was all these other people walking my walk, <laughs> sailing my sail and knowing where to direct me with so many reasons. I mean, this Harbor picture, I actually, I actually took this picture of the Vancouver Harbor myself when I was delivering my Ted talk to 12,000 a meeting with 12,000 people in the ophthalmology and research world to give this message of no more, no more of this good luck. No, if we can, if we can support families and children and adults living with blindness from day one, look at my boys, look at my boys and what they've been able to accomplish and they're just getting started. And that should be the 70, 80, 90, a hundred percent of the people that are blind and visually impaired having those stories as opposed to those big numbers being unemployment. And I know that we can get there. I know we're already moving the needle on that. So I had always ended with this picture and with the mountain in the back quoting Kathy Nimmer saying, it is our job to help our kids and, and adults in our lives get to the top of their mountain, not ours. But I'm gonna take it one step further. I actually took this on our favorite beach last year. This is a, a little boat with the bright sun and a whole ocean out there that is lit up and waiting for a wild ride. That is what all of our, our children, our family members that are, have just been diagnosed with blindness, the students that we teach, the young people and older people that we support with, with a blindness and visual impairment, that we equip them fully and involve them in the process. They can get in their boat and take on their own waters for the adventure of their lifetime. I'm so happy that you all are here to, to be a part of all of that. And then the final slide is Michael on graduation day. One of my dreams was that he would be a valedictorian and um, I had to let it go or so I thought. Michael ended up to be the valedictorian with over 600 kids in his class and the people behind him. This is my favorite part of the, this picture that somebody had sent me of that day. That's the school board and the administrators and the president of the class. Every single one of them in kindergarten and first grade had no expectations for Michael. They said maybe 70%. And Michael out achieved 600 kids while being himself with his incredible personality and creating friendships that will last a lifetime and have lasted through college um, and did it his way. And I will say this, his speech was about building a team that not we all don't have everything we need. We need to bring people in and have them on our team to do the things that we can't do um, and to work together. And then he ended it by saying, but life isn't a one-way street. You need to be out there looking for whose team needs you and be a part of it. And that is why I'm so proud that, that all three of my kids are with me in this thriving blind journey. And I'm so happy um, and grateful that you all invited me here tonight. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if we have time for. Oh, okay. Yep. Sorry. I was having a problem getting my mute turned off. <laughs> I apologize <laughs> about that. Um, yes, we have. Uh, th thank you, Kristen. That was amazing um, to hear you and your story and seeing all those awesome pictures of the boys. And that was amazing. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a couple of questions here. What kids books would you recommend to empower kids with visual impairment? What kids books? Boy, you're taking me back to, you know, <laughs> honestly, um, there were none about kids with visual impairments. We actually are coming out with Thriving Blind Junior for kids to have this ignition from the very beginning. But I will say this, um, in terms of empowerment and confidence building, my kids read the other, the same books that other kids were reading and learning those principles that are taught in the school right alongside them. I do want more of, of 
them being represented, which is why we're coming out with Thriving Blind Junior. But I'd be very interested to know from other people in the room, um, and maybe they can put it in the chat, if there are books that they're aware of, because I would love to reach out to those authors and see what those stories are so we don't duplicate or at least have the same type of um, you know, message, making sure our kids are empowered from day one. All right, unmute myself again. Um, all right, let's see. Um, there was okay. Um, so this one, you there's a comment here, Kristen. You're an inspiration. Thank you for doing this webinar. And the question is, um, did your sons ever express frustration over how they were missing to see things when they were with their friends who were sighted? And if so, how did you help them overcome that? You know, honestly, um, they they never talked about missing stuff that people could see. They would get frustrated um, that when they can't access things simply because of us sighted people not giving them access. But I, I, I say that, but I will tell you this. When, um, and Michael's always, I mean, I say I'm a delirious optimist. That kid, the glass is half full of something unbelievable, right? It was his driver's license and the story's coming to mind and heart because my daughter that my sighted daughter is going for her driver's license and it was something that my boys missed out on and i didn't know that michael was getting hit as hard as he was by it until a friend came to me and told me he was very upset and it was the first time in 16 years that i just could not fix it and fix it either with my nagging you know my stalking like all of my strategies nothing could change that so instead and this is a very um, i'm so happy somebody asked this um it's a it's a very good lesson what i learned is okay so 16 michael can't drive that's a big thing for everybody but he's not like everybody else so i said what is something that is very unique to michael he was a musician and like we were like we are classic rock obsessed right our house is so loud they call it the drum house in the neighborhood so it just so happened that around Michael's 16th birthday, there were three of his favorite classic rock bands in and around Philly and New York in a four day weekend. And I got them to all, it was like Springsteen, Billy Joel and Brian Adams. And that's how I celebrated his 16th birthday with something that was extremely meaningful to him. And it was one of the greatest weekends of our life. But I think I went a little too far because then Michael said he went back to school and told the story and he said, mom, all my friends are asking if they don't get their license, could you take them to concerts? <laughs> but the, the point, and Mitch, actually, I showed the picture of him at Team USA. That was his 16th birthday. He got to be in Colorado Springs with Team USA headquarters for his 16th birthday. So it was very meaningful to them. So they don't look back. And I guess that's kind of how I've done their lives all these years, what means something to them. They don't really look back with, with regret. They did get both of them denied jobs during 2020 because of their vision, which I don't know if I can say that it pissed me off, but it was it made me so mad. But I fueled it into something that's coming that's unbelievable. However, so I would say what's meaningful to them. And you know what? Just talk to them about it. Just honor, honor if they're upset, if they're frustrated. I listen. I don't necessarily try to fix right away anymore. I listen. And then I do try to find somebody that had a similar experience that that is on the other side positively that can talk to them about it. Yeah, Kristen, I'm glad you brought that up about like about the driving and like the uh, maybe in school, like they're exposed to driver's education. Some states require mm -hmm. all students, no matter what, um, to take driver's education. And sometimes that does bring up those you know, th that feeling like I'm going to be missing out on this. And it, you know, it's, it's like a rite of passage, right, for, for everyone. And, um, but there's actually a curriculum uh, called Finding Wheels. And if, uh, you know, for, for parents who don't know about that, maybe that's something that you can mention to your child's orientation and mobility specialist or their TVI. Um, Catherine, do, do you know more about, I'm not an orientation and mobility specialist, so I'm not, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have a whole lot more information about that. Catherine, did you, do you have anything to add about the, the finding wheels by any chance? Sure. I mean, it's, okay. it's um, basically set up to help folks um, understand all the different options that are there 
you know, and, and I know the new version, she added stuff on like rideshare and that kind of thing, but it's, it's really about kind of, it isn't all about just owning your own car. Um, mm. So yeah, I, I'm going to go and pull, um, I'm going to try to find the thing for you. I'm going to find something for you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go off. Yeah, thanks. I I didn't mean to put you on the spot or anything, but I, I just, when you, when you talked about that, Kristen, it just reminded me about that curriculum. Cause I, uh, when I was a professor, I did have a doc student who researched driver's education and kids with visual impairments and blindness and like the emotional issues, psychosocial issues involved in yeah. that. And, um, and it's a very real thing. It is Wait, very can I real. Tell you the funniest story real quick. This, this will give yeah. you total insight into my Michael. And it's a very important way to think about this. So like I said, you know, Michael's pretty positive, but we've always tried to find creative solutions where he's not sitting in victim mode and, and upset. It, we let him sit there for a minute and then we figure it out, right? In our school, they have 600 kids in his class, but that's every class. It is ginormous. It's like a junior college, right? They have a special parking lot for, you have to hit a certain GPA and you get a pass into this parking lot, right? So Michael goes, well, I went into that lot. He researched all the rules and there was no rule saying that you had to have sight to have a parking pass for that lot. You know what he did? He got the okay to get the, the pass. We, I had to go, this is hilarious. I had to get in line in the summer with all these people trying to get that pass the day it opened with my 50 bucks, right? The secretary pulls me out of line and says, Mrs. Medley, um, he's not gonna drive a car, is he? <laughs> I said, no. And she goes, well, you guys figure everything else out. I thought you figured out how to have him drive. I said, no, here's what he did. He got the pass, texted all of his friends that didn't make the GPA to get one and said, who wants to drive me to school? And he had them on a rotating list. And I had parents that were mad at me because they thought, wait a minute, he didn't make that GPA. So he shouldn't be driving. He shouldn't have the honors lot. He should be walking up the big hill. It was hilarious. That's how Michael got it. How ride. ingenious. <laughs> That's awesome. He never took the bus in junior so year. That's awesome. I mean, you talk <laughs> about problem solving. That's great. You know, there was no rule against it. So, you know, there you go. He did it. Oh <laughs> what God. a smart boy. That's amazing. I love it. Um, but yes, I, I just when you were talking about that, you know, we just don't realize how how that the driving issue can take a toll on our kids, you know, mm -hmm. when, when you're, when it comes to that rite of passage. So yeah. um, just wanted to let you know that there's actually a curriculum to help with, with, uh, oh, cool. with those issues, not necessarily driving, but like all the other options for, mm -hmm. you know, getting around being independent. So um, let's see, there's another question here. Um, did you ever need to have a discussion with either of your boys about what makes them different from other kids? And if so, did you uh, did you address did you address this? A parent I work with asked me this question today. As my kid, my VI kids are eighteen and twenty one, and I can share my experience, but wondering about yours too. Yeah, you know, I one of the advantages I will say to to LCA CRB one, you know, having it so early onset is my boys didn't really miss much they they didn't have much to miss so because of that they just have always done stuff the way they've done it and they've always been in public school in the community stuff we used to do a huge event here um, and we were very well known so they were always just kind of in the mix and didn't really have too many struggles until middle school and it wasn't really them it was me because as the kids were always coming to my house was the one with I mean my backyard was a soccer field and there's always hoopla here and everyone would always come knock on the door and then continue up the street knocking for everybody and in middle school they just kept going and they weren't knocking anymore but a mom had warned me years prior that middle school was going to be tough that the kids just they just don't know what to do they're so concerned about themselves that they can't possibly be as empathetic as we want them to be um, so they were a hard couple of years and some of it was with some of Michael's best friends um, that just got a little weird, but that mom was right. They eventually came around. Now in terms of, I think the question was about missing, that they were missing stuff. Um, my boys never really missed out on much or did, we didn't necessarily look at it as them missing out. But I will say some things just, 
they would get upset about and it would hit me out of out of the blue like you have all these things that you have to you know overcome and this one little dinky thing is something that would throw you for a loop I don't know I guess that's just parenting too you think you know your kid and then they come at you with something but honestly we have um I guess everybody says sit around the kitchen table and talk I don't know about you guys but we have this little kitchen island and that's where we sit Mm-hmm. And we just, I, I've always, um, hmm, I've just always had conversations with my boys. I let them, I let them tell me the stuff that's going on and I tell them, you know, and I usually mess up, especially, especially in divorce and being a single mom, I am like professional at messing this up. Right. But we talk about it. We just talk about everything. And as hard as that is those years where sometimes I'm the only one that is talking to them when the kids mm-hmm. got a little weird and all that, um, I will say now that my son is in college and like people couldn't believe it was his 21st birthday and he invites me to come up and meet all of his buddies and go out with them. And my friends are like, who invites their mom? I'm like, we just have a very unique relationship. And if you can look at it as you're not gonna have all the answers and I'm not gonna have all the answers. However, if you keep communicating with them and do um, even like a lot of the social stuff I had to do with them when they didn't have anybody to do it with, um, not all of it, just some of it. And it just creates a very unique relationship. Yeah, and I, that's that's amazing to that uh, he invites you up there on his twenty first birthday. <laughs> How fun! I gotta tell you, I said to all my friends on Facebook. I posted. I said, I don't know who needs to hear this, but forty nine does not equal twenty one. <laughs> Yeah, your your brain says 21, your body says no, no. <laughs> no. Um, so that and part of the question was, um, did you have a discussion with either of the boys about what makes them different from other what kids? What makes them different? That's right. I'm sorry. I went off no, on. no, that's okay. No, that perfect. Go ahead. In our house, um, we have always talked about different in a way of extraordinary and making um that different is a good thing. Um it isn't I I presented in that light and we have conversations in that light. And I realize that sometimes for them, they just don't want different. They want to be exactly the same as everybody else. And I will say Michael was more driven than Mitch about being like everybody else. Mitch does not want to be like anyone else in his class. And unfortunately it's because he has a class of kids that are a mess. I mean, and I even have heard from teachers in the school that this class is a mess. And they actually had said to me that it's a good thing that he doesn't wanna be in the social circles like Michael was because there's so many problems with this class. But, and Mitch is one of those, like for his graduate, he's graduating high school and he said he doesn't want a huge party like Michael. He can only handle a certain amount of people. But my boys have never really, we haven't dwelled on being different. And when we do talk about it, it's more in, but what's unique and special about it. And honestly, we do say sometimes what sucks, like what sucks, but we, we flip it all so that you, Michael's always found the blind perks. He calls them. I think I even mentioned it in the book, like, you know, in Disney world, when everyone's given pitiful looks at us, Michael couldn't see that. What he knew was he essentially got a fast pass from Disney to be at the front of the line, you know, um, for that was pity working in a good way for him. So uh, we, we do tend to flip it that you look for the, the good in stuff and find your silver linings, but we do, I mean, I think it's important to acknowledge when things suck. And if it's, if it's different in a way that is painful, we address the pain and talk about it. I will say also there was a psychologist in um, the elementary school, our elementary school is K to six, and she had a special group for now that I think about it, it was like kids that are a little bit different, some of the ADHD, some kids that were struggling. And she invited my Michael in because he's so good with sitting next to people and having conversations and wanting to know more about them. He makes everybody very comfortable. And it was a, it was a group that Michael wanted to stay with. It was like fourth, fifth and sixth grade. They would give up a recess once a month and play board games and learn about taking turns and having conversation. And um, he got to know a lot of the kids that some of the kids didn't want to associate with and other kids that were more of the stronger, you know, had the popular kids. Um, it was very interesting. And then we asked for Mitch, I asked for Mitch to be involved in the same thing when he got to fourth grade. So that was a really interesting group where that psychologist would talk with them, have just conversation around a board game about things like differences. Um, but I would say definitely acknowledge when things suck. I have to stop, stop, stop saying suck. I, I have three teen or 21 year old. 
um, when things aren't optimal, I guess is the professional word, acknowledge it, talk about it. And is there a way just to either spin it or empower, empower the child to look at it differently um, of how a difference can be. Uh, I know some people use the word superpower um, or something nice and, and unique that sets them apart. Different isn't always a bad thing. So. No, I agree. Different is not always bad. Different, I mean, difference is what makes life interesting and what makes all of us interesting is to be different, you know? Yeah. Um, Although I guess other... we should also acknowledge that usually a middle schooler doesn't want to hear that. Well, yes, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they it's get all developmental. And they want to differentiate themselves and we're of like, of course, yeah. So that's why I color the gray every two weeks. Because... Yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody <laughs> asked a question about, did your kids draw the logo? Oh, for Thriving Blind for the uh -huh. book? Uh -huh. So it's the coolest story. That's actually, I have a nonprofit for Sierra B1. Um, I have, I run the patient organization that's now global. Another reason that I keep coloring the gray out of my hair. It is a very <laughs> good thing, but it's very busy. Um, and the, so the picture, the painting behind me, the smaller picture um, was done at one of my fundraisers where I had everyone had to put their thumbprint on the mission. That's why it's all different shades of blue. There's actually a congressman in there, um, some other elected officials from around our town. So they created that we created that for the fundraiser. And then when I was doing the book cover, I said I wanted that to be a part of, of it because I, I meshed everything I was doing in one project. And it was actually a kid that I went to elementary school with, to grade school, I went to Catholic school. Um, my mom saw on Facebook that he was doing book covers. My mom is like a Facebook crazed person. Um, she's one of those people that if I don't post on Facebook every day, she calls me and asks me, what's the matter? Like, am I okay? Am I alive? But um, so Eric, my friend from elementary school uh, put the cover together. But yeah, to answer your question, it was, that's like thumbprints all those blue dots are like 200 and some people that we had at this event and then my friend created that wow that's uh, that is so cool and, and it and was that... my great english teacher that was my editor oh wow okay. that is that's so cool See, when you guys are in my life you're in my life forever <laughs> Exactly. But it's, I, I guess I didn't really recognize that it was like made up of small, like little circles. Yeah. And now that you say it, it became very apparent. Like, that's what that is. <gasps> that is so neat. Isn't I love it. Crazy? Yeah. It was so funny to see all these like dignitaries, you know, with all these blue, big blue thumbs. I'm like, <laughs> oh, thumbs. by the way, I was an elementary school teacher. So this is the kind of thing we do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, that's perfect. Um, okay, so there was a couple of just like some comments about um, TSBVI, which is the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired, is doing a coffee hour on April 19th, focusing on the active traveler or independent traveler. Oh. Um, and if uh, you go to the tsbvi.edu, check coffee hour, and then the registration link is there. Um, Catherine put in the chat um, a link to the Finding Wheels webinar that I mentioned about the, the curriculum Finding Wheels. Oh, awesome. And um, yeah. there's a, actually a webinar on it. And so she, um, she put that in the chat. Thank you um, very much. Catherine for that. Okay. And then there is a question here. Um, did your kids ever ask why they were different? Um, she, let's see, the, my family has a four-year-old recognizing that he is the only one wearing a hat and sunglasses to go outside. So did, did the boys ever ask you why they were different? Um, it wasn't, it, the language wasn't about being different, just Mitchell couldn't stand, um, my boys are so different. I swear to God, Mitch couldn't stand the hat and sunglasses, but also he didn't have the pain. Michael, it was actually, it still is painful for him to be out in the sun and Mitch, it wasn't. And Mitch, we tried to have glasses on him, but it turns out that his field of vision where he, ha he has like this little tiny sliver that he can see up close and the frame of the glasses was in the way of it. So he fought me on glasses forever. And then finally I realized what his field of vision was. Thank you to you guys that do those field tests and the ophthalmologist. And then we said, oh my gosh, it's blocking his vision. But, um, but it, he didn't really ask about why he had to do that or be, or was frustrated in terms of being different. It was simply not something he wanted to do. And when Mitch doesn't want to do something. <laughs> 
<laughs> you won't do it. <laughs> well, even now, now here's an interesting one for all of you that have eye pressers. He was an eye presser and I did everything. I researched it. I talked to everyone for the folks that you guys at TSV VVI, when I did the big conference out there right before the world shut down, I'm like, your IT people have me on the board saying, oh my God, here she comes crashing the server again because I'm always researching stuff there. But I researched everything about eye pressing. It turns out all we had to say to Mitch was he was in first grade. They gave him four quarters in the morning. And if anyone had to, he's so into money, you guys, he is so into money. And that's what we found out was his thing. If anyone had to tell him to stop pressing his eyes, he had to hand over a quarter. He handed over <laughs> one quarter. And we had the whole IEP team in on it. He handed over oh. one quarter and never did it again. Wow. <laughs> but that little bugger, he didn't say, we didn't know yet. Cause I was checking in with the team like every two weeks or whatever to give him a break from me. Yeah. He was talking to him all those quarters. We didn't wow. know. And then the next day he would get four more and he would get four more. Uh -huh. And then he had this whole thing of quarters. He's brilliant. <laughs> Wow, I'm glad that worked because it, it's hard to find something to motivate the kids yeah. to to not you know press or poke their eyes. You gotta find their thing. Um, Some so people it takes a while to find their thing, but Mitch, I knew right off the bat. I'm like, this kid is obsessed with money. He still is. <laughs> well, that's good. He's a saver. So if yeah. he didn't want to give away his money, he stopped poking his eye to keep a, <laughs> keep a handle yeah. on it. No, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, um, okay, let's see. There's um, a comment here. Um, this gives me hope. Thank you. Just this morning, I was back in tears and panic mode. Uh, I have a quote unquote, not blind enough son, and I'm trying to figure out, figure this out and find my way as you have done. So happy to have found you. So that's great. Oh, great. And, and everybody, especially the person that made that comment, look up, um, if you go to thrivingblind.com, we're starting these groups where you can come in and, and, and connect and we can walk through this and hear from other people. Um, Cause I, look, I, I, and you'll see on my, on my website, it's actually under construction, but you'll see on all of my stuff, I sink back in, I still do it. I mean, look at where my boys are. You see their pictures and, and all the stuff they've accomplished. And there are times when I'm just like, Oh, mm -hmm. trying to figure something out, or I get scared about, you know, like, oh my gosh, Michael's graduating college. I was, it was nervous when he went to college. Now I'm like, oh, he's going to mm -hmm. go out in the world. Like, I don't know. My boys find it hilarious, by the way. They find it hilarious that I go into the pit. Like, get a hold of yourself, mom. <laughs> you know, like, hey, I got you. I know that it's, it's hard and, and we slip back into it, but that's why. I've, that's the part of the why why family connect is so important. Thriving blind is important to build. Go where the people are that that are going to help you build that tribe, you know, mm -hmm. and and lean on people. And then the best part is, you guys, for me, I felt like I was leaning on everyone for so long. And the fact that I now can bring people together and be the one that people lean on and, and reach back and help somebody out. I think that is the best thing. It's the best feeling in the world to be able to do that. So let all of us that are here be that for you. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome advice. Um, I think one of the last things I'll say um, from the chat is um, the librarian at Perkins shared a list of young adult books that focused on growing up with a disability. Oh, cool. um, let's see. And um, it's worth reaching out to her. I think lots of youth librarians would be happy to help um, as well on a book list. So that's that's great right there. So, um, well, I mean, we are at the end of our time. It goes so fast. Wow. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for, for sharing and thank the audience for, for being here and, and just getting all this wonderful information. And hopefully, you know, this, this helps you um, know that, that um, you know, you can do it <laughs> and your kids can do it. And, uh, you know, hang in there and make sure you, you know, visit Kristen's website um, and her Facebook page. Um, that information is, um, uh, is available. I know we put it in the chat, but there's also um, something that'll go out to you that has the links um, to her website sites and, and her resources. And then of course, always uh, visit Family Connect. We always have webinars going on and lots of blogs and um, resources to help you
navigate um, uh, navigate this period in your life with your with your kiddos. Um, and so um, again, thank you so much, Kristen. I'm sure we'll see you again. Um, looking forward to that. And um, her kids are going to be doing a tech. Uh, what is it? Top tech talk. A tech, tech talk. talk. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I was like trying to say that really teen, fast three times. Teen uh -huh. tech talk on April fifth. Thank you. Teen yeah, Tech Talk on April 5th. Yeah. yeah, so be sure you guys, you know, go to our uh, AP Age Connect Center website and find the webinars and get registered. Um, so I'd like to thank you again, uh, Kristen, for, you know, sharing your story and, um, you know, for being a part of Family Connect. We really appreciate it. So oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this. Honestly. Oh, yeah. Research no, thank you. I when I was, was grown up with my kids. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you. This is great.